Auditions, Entrepreneurial Skills, and Deliberate Practice with Barrick Stees. Stay inspired. Could you please start with sharing any bassoon practicing techniques or advice that you have around everyday practice? Working from a position of strength and working outwards. Another way is to take the part that's really bothering you and take a small enough part of that, the, the hardest part, and, and work that out so that you can play. It may even be just four notes or something like that, but you can play it perfectly up to tempo. But take a small enough portion um, where you can do it five, seven times in a row. By the way, if you're doing it 10 times in a row, that's wasted practice, I think, unnecessary. Okay, so then the, the other, the, the same method applies. You bridge out from there until you, you're building this, this uh, really predictable edifice of, of, uh, of precise uh, technique. That's the, that's the verse method. It can, it's very versatile. Um, you can also um, do another method, which uh, again, I think many people do. I call it the pyramid. And it's just like um, if, you, if you do any weight training, strength training, um, you know, you, you, you lift a, a lower weight many times, you add weight, you do it fewer times until you get to the top. Um, and then the, the, then you also cool down. So you do more reps and slower. So you go up the pyramid and down the pyramid like that. Um, this is also um, important to remember. Um, you need to be if you're like me, you don't want to get your pride involved. Okay, so if you mess up and you feel yourself getting angry and saying, you know, darn it, I can do this, and you do it again and you screw up, then you're digging yourself in a hole. So you're practicing mistakes. So that, that's one problem that can come up when you're in the middle of all this. So you have to re, re, retract your claws from the, the situation, pull back and start over. Okay, so sometimes taking a little break is helpful with these things. That pyramid method is probably something everybody does already. Nothing, nothing uh, really special about that. The other one I like is what I call the skeleton. And the skeleton is a way of understanding the deep structure of a technical passage by leaving out parts of um, a run. Let's say you're playing Marriage of Figaro. You're learning Marriage of Figaro start out by playing only notes on the big half note beats. Okay. Again, if you look at the blog, this is all these stages are written out in, in, um, in score and you can, you can understand it better than hearing me talk about it, but do that, play those, those big beat notes. And while you're doing that, sing to yourself the whole thing. Okay. So you're singing all of the notes, but only playing those big beat notes. The intermediate stage is to add the notes on the quarter note beats and sing the whole part while you're just playing those quarter note beats. And then finally adding all those notes together. You'll notice after doing that, when you, when you, when you break it down like that, that you phrase better, your fingers feel smoother and you get through the passage uh, more cleanly when you do that. Part of that is I think that you understand the way um, a phrase works in, with its, its, its uh, sort of underlying structure. It seems to help people play more cleanly. So those are the three ways of, of practicing that I like. And they work best after you've you know, learned the notes, sketched in how you want to play it, and so on. This is a way to get you over the gap of playing something uh, many times at a slow tempo and getting it to a, you know, a repeatable, consistent, clean uh, performance tempo. Barry Kayla from Wichita asks, what does your preparation for auditions look like? So um, let me put this up here. This is on my, on my web website. Um, what I've got here is a sample audition uh, rap list. So we've got the Mozart concerto. And then we've got this big list of stuff. You'll notice that there are no uh, major numbers or cue marks. You're just learning the whole Beethoven symphony number four. So it's fair game to ask, you know, the Alberti baseline in the first movement, you know, 
or the little uh, timpani like solo in the second movement, you know, all this stuff. So it's a huge laundry list of things, right? Um, this list is designed to scare people away, right? Auditions are negative experiences. Um, you know, they, they are, generally speaking. The point is, is there's too many of you out there and not enough jobs. Um, and so they're trying to keep people away. Don't let this deter you, okay? There is a way to break down a list like this that, that I think works really well, provided you've given yourself time to do so. So here's what I do. Um, I break it down. There are a number of ways to, to break it down. But I, I break it down this way, and this is personal for me. Unfamiliar, the things I'm not too familiar with. Uh, the Bartok Dance Suite, Berg Wozzeck, Stravinsky Violin Concerto, those are pretty unusual offbeat pieces to have on an audition, right? By the way, the Wozzeck is on there because there's high Fs in those excerpts. Um, then there, there are excerpts that give me personally uh, fits, okay? These are hard for me. I've always got to keep on top of those. And then because we're, we're, we're trying to make this a time-saving effort and, and something that's plan planable and manageable, I also need to have a feel for what I'm probably going to be comfortable with and what's familiar to me. For somebody like me that's been playing for decades, this will be a longer list than for someone who's in their 20s. Then I make a practice schedule. Um, this one is based on an eight week model, but you can do one for 12 weeks or however long you want. So I'll run down this really quick, but it's on the website. So if, if I skip over things quickly, um, you can look it up yourself. Week one, I need to get uh, a really good uh, grasp on the task at hand. So I, I try to practice the whole list with emphasis on unfamiliar excerpts. Um, early on, I try to do a fair amount of score study and listening, and I keep a practice log. And in particular, I'm noticing um, any excerpts that have slipped, you know, some familiars that don't feel as familiar as I thought they would. This always surprises, and I, I, I might uh, add those to the perennial challenge list. Um, in week two, I will con continue with the unfamiliar list. So the, the early weeks are, are focused on getting the unfamiliar more familiar, okay? Um, and then I start technical slow practice. This is very important. I'm not playing Beethoven fourth up to tempo at this point. I don't let myself do that, okay? I'm building a solid foundation of successful practicings of a piece like Beethoven fourth at a slow tempo, okay? The audition is, you know, seven weeks away. I don't have to go nuts at this point, okay? Um, and then I do some recording and I try to videotape. Um, this is because, um, you know, p human nature says that if we can see you at an audition, let's say your auditions are not completely blind, you know, someone that's weaving around like a, you know, a flag in the wind or something like that. I mean, and, and plays as well as anybody else. I mean, who are they gonna hire, you know? So that, the, those ticks that, that everyone has in their, in their visual uh, aspect need to be worked out at this point. You need to get that out of your system. Don't stick out. Um, and then, yeah, make no visual mannerisms. Um, and my listening is always with either the bassoon part and, and earbuds or headphones on. I do not listen casually here. And I, 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 I click off a tempo to myself while I hear the recording to see if I'm playing in rhythm, okay? And I've got a score in my hand, um, either the bassoon part or orchestral score, and I'm making notes. And then I add excerpts that are in unsatisfactory shape to next week's list. Um, I won't run down the rest of this. You can see how this goes. Um, and really, um, anyone that uses this grid should personalize it to their own strengths and weaknesses. You could have a, a week of high note excerpt practice, for instance, you know, 
or you, you could just do technique for the first half of, of your preparation. I mean, there, there are lots of ways to do this. Um, as a bassoonist, I'm, I'm, consider, I'm, I'm also very interested in making a large stockpile of reeds, more reeds than I've ever made for a regular work week. I went through 50 reeds for my first uh, Cleveland Orchestra audition. And there was only one reed in there that I thought really, really did the job. You know, that's a very high failure rate, right? Um, but that was important to do because uh, you need your best equipment. So, uh, you know, take a look at this on the website, use the list, um, make it your own list. Um, there's a, a really good um, um, uh, audition guru named Don Green, which some of you may know. Um, Don uh, recommends doing a taper uh, in the final week of your practicing. And I like that idea. I haven't added that into this one, but I think that's good. I'm a, a, a marathon runner. And when you do training for an endurance race like that, um, what happens is you actually overtrain on purpose um, during the training session leading up to the event. You need taper so that you have recovery before the event. This is true in auditions too, mentally and physically. Um, you have to go in as fresh as you can and as energized as you can. So the last week, you have to have the courage not to cram, okay? So there should be a, a taper built into the last week of this. I don't have that in here, but I think that would be a, a good thing to, to add to this. I don't also list mock auditions. Um, I, I think those are those are actually very important. Um, I think there's a trend now to do too many of them and to make them make them seem kind of trivial. You end up practicing mediocrity when you do that, I think. Um, I would do a mock audition every two weeks in your preparation for, for you know, like that. You're really your best critic anyway. So if you're hearing yourself on recordings and really listening well, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna go astray. Um, so that's the that's the rundown of that. Could you please share what you listen for sitting on the audition panel? Okay, yeah, well, um, I think a lot of people would agree that uh, playing in in time is is extremely important. So pulse has got to be um, maybe one of the two or three number one parameters that someone has mastered um, in order to be successful. Um, it has to be accurate, right? But I don't think it needs to be a perfect audition. Um, in fact, um, I actually think it's okay if you screw up Beethoven fourth and ask to do it again. You know, because really for all of us, that one either goes well or it doesn't. You can't make a mid-course correction in the middle of that that solo with a grace note in the last movement. There's no there's no chance to to come back. And, and sort of pick up the pieces there. And I think everybody understands that given if everything else in the audition has gone well um, and you get another chance to do it again, I think you can always ask maybe one excerpt to do again um, in, a, uh, in an audition. And, and by gosh, you better nail it when, when, you, uh, when you ask to do it again. And, and if you don't, okay, it's just not your day, but uh, you know, I think that's, that's important. So um, accuracy is important, of course. Intonation may, for me is the next one. And that's, that's extremely important. You need to be able to play in tune with yourself. If you're, if the audition requires you to play with other people, uh, you know, we can hear pretty obviously whether it's in tune or not, but, but um, really, really playing beautifully in tune with yourself and having a homogenous scale too, because timbre and intonation are intimately related. Um, you're, you're, you could actually be playing in tune with a tuner, but if you have a note that sticks out timbre wise, it can sound out of tune to someone listening. Okay, those two are, are really tied together in our ears. 
So you have to play in tune and you also have to have a hom homogenous scale. Um, your instrument, all the notes in your instrument need to have a family resemblance to each other. You know, high register needs to have the same quality of sound, basically, as the low register does. And this is because we're a team instrument. We're not a solo instrument. We blend, we add to another instrument's sound. We're not very often a soloist in the orchestra. We're not hiring a soloist, generally speaking. We're hiring a team player. So blending and fitting in is really important. That's why intonation is really important and having the even timbre is really important. Um, I think also um, we all like to choose people that have an innate musicality and that is where the subjective nature of, of judging someone's playing comes in. So, you know, a lot of people um, make the mistake of, of, of taming their musicality or trying somehow to fit the style of what they think of the Cleveland Orchestra plays in or, you know, National Symphony, Chicago Symphony, whatever. That's, that's, a, that's a fool's errand, okay? Um, you have to remember that what you're selling is is what you've learned over, you know, for, for many of decades. And you don't want to throw all that away in an afternoon's audition. You can't do that um, because you, you, people will notice that and, and you won't play your best anyway if you're trying to make yourself something you're not. You have to be okay with the idea that you might be the very best, um, you know, apple in the, uh, in the market and the person buying that day is buying oranges and they're not, they don't need apples. That happens a lot at auditions, you know. Um, but you can't make yourself into an orange if you're an apple. So you have to be okay with that somehow. And that's, that's very frustrating. But so back to your, your, back to the question though. Yeah, we need to hear someone who's got a musical idea and it's, it's, um, it's very similar to being like the, um, the, uh, uh, you know, the head waiter in a really great restaurant, you know, when a customer walks in um, that you've seen before, this little tape goes in your head and plays exactly what they ordered last time they were here and where they like to sit. Okay, so you put them over there. And that's, that's where you go in with your best idea of what, what, um, what you want to do with the music. Okay. And, and you may have a situation where the, where the, um, the customer says, well, we don't want to sit in, in the window this time, or we don't want to try, we want to try something new on the menu. And that's, that, that happens in auditions where they will say, okay, fine, but um, let's hear it a little faster or play with, um, you know, brighter articulation or something like that. Then you have to turn on a dime and, and, and try your, uh, try your best to, uh, uh, change your style there. Okay. But that's a good challenge because that means they heard something that they, that they thought was, was usable and moldable and they wanted to see what you would do. Uh, it's not that they hated you. Um, so those, just to review, those things are important. The, the pulse is absolutely essential. It's gotta be really good. Okay. Very easy to, you, you know, it's, it's, um, it's hard for people to agree whether you have a good sound or not, or whether they like your sound, but they, they can pretty much agree whether you're playing in tune or whether you're playing with good pulse. Okay. So those things have to be in place and it has to be accurate, but also we are hiring musicians. We're not hiring, um, you know, um, crafts, crafts people. So we have to hear someone that's got a soul, someone that, that sings a line and, uh, and has a musical approach too. Sarah from West Orange, New Jersey asks, please share about your advice on microphone placement and making recordings at home. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not very good at this, so I'm not sure I can offer great advice, but the bassoon, I've played, I've played uh, studio gigs in, um, in Chicago in my early days, and I went into different studios to do uh, TV commercials and stuff. Every single engineer put put the mic somewhere different on the bassoon. Okay, the bassoon is not a directional instrument uh, like the trumpet is. You know, the trumpet's very cut and dry. 
sound comes out the bell, you know. Uh, so it's really hard to mic the bassoon properly, but I can tell you this. Um, uh, the best result I've had is with um, a two microphone setup where where the mics are, are set up like this and, and it pretty much bisects the, the, the length of the bassoon and it's a good 10 feet away. You know, start with that, see if that helps. Um, you have to experiment in yourself and, and the room is important too, obviously, right? So I don't know, I think a, you know, an audio technician might give you a better answer than me and maybe some other people on this panel might have better answers. I don't, I don't think I have a really good answer for that question. Could you please share your thoughts on how to cultivate entrepreneurial skills within and outside the music industry? Yeah, this is really important today, especially post COVID. We're, we don't know, we don't know uh, what's going to be uh, available to us that we had before COVID, you know, some of our organizations are not going to be in business when we come back. Um, many, if not all, will be changed in some substantial way. Um, and um, again, I may not be the best person to answer this question just because I'm, I'm towards the end of my career and I'm in an orchestra. It's kind of like the military. It takes care of everything. It tells you what to do. You know, so to hear me talk about this, maybe I can offer a few things, but I have to be pretty humble and say, I think there are others that probably know more about this than, than me and probably some people on this call that could offer better advice than me. But I will say this, um, what I have seen from my students is um, in a, um, a, uh, an inventiveness about collaboration uh, and also about um, engaging with the community that you're part of and taking taking risks and and forming partnerships with other arts organizations other people doing things in the arts and creating your own your own uh, ensemble or your own uh, collaborative and that's risky because i mean you're not going to get full health benefits out of your your chamber music collective right that's just not going to happen and you're going to be working really hard and you're going to be doing a lot of stuff away from the instrument just to make that happen but i think that is where the where the future is the orchestra world is not a growth industry in the united states it just isn't um you know it, it's it's very very tough so i think um working with um if there's an art center in your community that that wants to do um, collaborations, um, if there's a, a dance company, if there are artists, um, you know, writers, I think that's the way it is. And bassoon players have always been collaborative, right? No one makes a solo career on the bassoon, so we've we've got that in our DNA, and it's just up to us to develop that, right? Nobody's gonna, yeah, I mean, that's just so unrealistic. During these challenging COVID times, could you please discuss more about your views on making virtue out of necessity? Yeah, I mean, when you're given, another cliche, when you're when you're given lemons, you need to make lemonade, you know, and I've seen my, my students put together porch concerts and um, you know, do all kinds of things that they maybe wouldn't normally do, um, just to keep going. Um, you know, we are, we're during lockdown. I, 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 I thought, um, for the mental health of my students and the physical health, that we just get together once a week and go out and go running together. Um, I mean, that's been really good for a lot of us. I think it's, I know it's been good for me just to see them because I don't get to see them uh, except on a screen, which is extremely frustrating. So, you know, things like that is that that's really, that's really important. Um, I think to, um, to look around at the circumstances like we're all doing right now, we've all learned how to manage these platforms of zoom or, or, um, 
you know, FaceTime or whatever you use to communicate now. And we're all adept at sharing a screen, playing a video and all that stuff. I couldn't do any of that last year at this time. Um, so, you know, you will figure things out, um, but you, you have to look around and, and, uh, and uh, see what's available to you and try to think differently. I know that's kind of a crappy answer again. I'm, I hope I'm not disappointing you here. <laughs> Uh, but I think, and I think there's, there's again, like in my, my, you know, in my position, I've got this huge infrastructure that is still paying me a little, you know, it's not paying me full salary, but I'm still getting paid. And so I'm not the right person to ask about <laughs> this question, really. I have to be really humble about it. Barry, I'll share some of the questions from the chat section now. Um, there's one question um, before from Richard Meek that has asked, do you remember playing South Bend with John Steinspring? Mm -hmm. Yeah, John played on a Couturiano system Fox bassoon, which I had never seen before. I, I think he put it in my hands once and I had no idea what to do with it. Um, is a really nice man, but I, I've, I've not heard from him in years. So Michael Burns has asked, what might the taper down in audition preparation look like? Yeah, there's, there's a number of ways to do this. And I, there's, you know, I, I have asked my students to do this before recitals or, or if they seem especially stressed over something. And, um, one thing to do is to get out pieces that you really enjoy playing and just play through them for fun. And remember how fun it is to play the bassoon uh, and get out of the, the, the stress mode that, that we're in when uh, you know, we're being very self-critical. Um, so that's part of the taper that you want in there. Uh, rediscover your love for the instrument, the love for, for uh, making music. Um, but the taper itself um, also has much more to do with re reducing the amount of time on the instrument during those weeks and finding something else to do with the time, okay? Uh, and that takes a lot of trust, right? You, you're always thinking, well, can I still do it? Can I still do it? Can I still do it? You know, you don't need to do that. Um, you need to rest, you need to exercise, you need to eat well, um, take care of your body and your mind during that, the week before. If you need more than that and you've prepared well, then, and then start slowly doing that two weeks before. A marathon runner generally starts a taper two weeks before uh, so that the body can, can recover and, and you can have your full strength when you go to race. Um, I think some of that works with, uh, with music, too. Uh, you may change your practice method, too, and just do some different kinds of practice with those excerpts. But it's more about, about taking less time on the instrument, especially if you're injury prone. You know, if you have any physical problems playing, you want to be careful about that, too. By the way, with those, those practice methods, I... I outlined, especially the pyramid practice where you're doing lots of reps. Be very careful that you notice if you are in any physical pain or anything starts to feel numb, stop. Okay, because you can injure yourself. And that's another reason not to repeat things more than five, six, seven times when you're doing it. It's just pointless and it's also uh, kind of dangerous. You can, you can hurt yourself doing that. Kapras makes a good point about, you know, that just having fun playing the bassoon, that we can do that anytime too. Wykit Leong has asked, do you make or use different kinds of reeds for different pieces? When I have them, I do, but I don't, I don't, uh, I've never been good at making specific reeds from, from the get-go about, you know, making a high note reed. I mean, I, I, I understand how to do it, I don't need to know how to do it, but what ha what ends up happening with me is that I I make um, enough reads where there's a spectrum of of different um, proclivities in the reads that I have that I, I deem acceptable. So if I'm breaking in a read and I repeatedly go back to that read, 
in it. Um, it has really beautiful high notes, very easy free high notes, but I can't seem to scrape in or make the reed play good low register. I'm not going to force that reed to do that. And I may put that reed aside and just say, you know, I don't read. It's got a decent, you know, and then I can round the wires. Right. I know how to do that. Okay. I can take more out of the corners of the tip. Right. Good, good. Okay. You know, I can, I can thin the rails and, and push it further in that direction. Uh, but I've never been good at, um, you know, Willard Elliott actually was really good at this. He used a number of different shapes and his, his read box was like a painter's palette. Um, I've never been able to um, uh, develop that quality, that, that ability. But when I'm breaking in a read, I try to notice what the read just seems like that read will never do well, but there is something maybe that it does very, very naturally. And then I will mark that read and isolate it. Just for an example, my first Cleveland or Orchestra audition, I took three auditions for my position over the period of nine months. My first audition, I used three reads in the audition and two vocals. My second audition, I used two reads and three vocals. Um, I had to get used to that idea. It used to drive me nuts. I used to, I mean, I wasn't capable of doing that for a long time, but I, you know, I grew a thick skin about it. Barry Lee Munoz has asked, can you name a work that you have either performed or heard that was new to you in the past couple years that surprised you or blew you away? Hmm. Well, uh, I commissioned Jeff Rathman, our, our, our assistant principal oboist, to write a really good piece for me um, called uh, Shapes. And um, I enlisted my wife to make a, um, a video of her knitted images. Um, and it turned out to be a really good piece. And coincidentally, they didn't talk too much about the video and the, and the composition, which went along, which uh, developed at the same time. But it turned out that they, that both creations had a real affinity for each other and, and they worked well. And that the video, with uh, the soundtrack of me playing uh, Jeff's piece, um, the video won best in show in a, uh, in, in a national um, short animated um, video contest uh, last month. So I was really proud of, of Melinda for winning best in show in that one. That's on my uh, YouTube channel. If you just, uh, if you just, um, um, you know, search for my name and uh, it's either Shaping Reality or Shapes. The video is called Shaping Reality. The piece is called Shapes by Jeff Rathbun. Um, I think it turned out really well. So that would be a piece I would, I would recommend. And uh, yeah, and Trevor publishes it. The next question is from Ara. If you have to, what kind of music do you recommend to listen to while preparing for an audition? Hmm. Yeah. I never listened to bassoon music very much. Um, I think um, I listen to singers and string players. And I think that's where you want to go. Um, you know, I actually, okay, so here's another thing. I think um, especially um, when you're preparing for an audition, I would say that early um, in your audition preparation, it's really good to just make a, a mixtape of all your, your favorite orchestra recordings of the pieces you're learning. However, that's just one interpretation. And so I would have that going, but then I would put that away as you're developing your, your interpretation of something. Um, I remember um, a, a short story I'll tell you. I was um, in between, um, I was my Christmas break, um, one of my years in college, and I went back to Chicago where I'm from. I heard the Chicago Symphony, and I heard them play Shostakovich Ninth, and I heard Willard Elliott play that solo. And I went home and practiced it, 
and brought it back, brought it into my lesson in January, I guess it was. And um, the first thing that Van Heusen said was, uh, well, who have you been listening to? Because it didn't sound like me. And that, that, that one concert I had burned into my brain, what, what Willard sounded like, maybe my vibrato was really different. I don't know what it was. But um, I'd gotten away from how I wanted to sound, and I, I, had, I had made myself kind of sound the way I had heard him play. I brought it in, and, and Van Hoosen was one of the most perceptive musicians I've ever met. And he noticed. So uh, recordings can, can do weird things to you. They, they're helpful, I think, early on in learning a piece. And especially if you're learning a solo piece, for goodness sake, you know, go listen to it a little bit, but put it away and, and, and go listen to another piece by Mozart or go listen to a, you know, another piece by Vivaldi. Don't listen to the bassoon player over and over. It really doesn't help. Bet, here's another thing. Okay, and I'm going to be a little, I'm going to be a little controversial here, but in America, in the United States, we are taught in a specific way to use vibrato and to play with a, a, a certain kind of sound. This is not how Europeans are taught. It's very different, okay? Um, but Europeans, Europeans do the bulk of concerto recording, let's face it, okay? So what does your young student do when they need to hear a recording of, you know, um, let's say the Wolf Ferrari piece or, or uh, Viola with Saranda. I mean, you know, you go on YouTube, of course, there's a lot of people out there that have done things, but generally, if you find a, you know, a famous European player and you go listen to it, of course, it sounds, it sounds terrific, but it's very different from how we use vibrato here, and, and the sound of the bassoon can be very different. Um, I don't find that particularly helpful if you want to, you know, make a career in the United States, for instance. It, it's still very different. Um, so that's maybe a little uh, chauvinistic or, or provincial of me to say, but um, it's a case in point why I think you need to get away from, from recordings uh, shortly after you start learning a piece. Go listen to another instrument or another singer, sing a piece in the same style, or play a piece in the same style by the same composer. That's much more instructional, I think. We have another question from Y. Kit Leong, just to clarify, from your Cleveland Orchestra audition, were you actually switching reeds and vocals in front of the Cleveland Orchestra audition committee? Yes. That committee wants you to hear you play your best. Okay? You need to have the right equipment on stage to play your best. Now, I wasn't taking a coffee break to switch vocals and put reeds on, right? I wasn't crowing reeds on stage. I wasn't fooling around, but I took a minute and I played a test note or two. Okay. Perfectly acceptable. What is something new that you've learned recently? Um, Let's see. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I suppose I'm learning that there's a lot more I don't know about a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, I've taken up a few, two new pursuits in my life that have been very, um, um, very stimulating and rewarding for me. One is um, I've got a pretty much a full working uh, metal shop in my basement. I make some of my reed tools in the basement, and I've learned quite a lot about uh, machining and 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 uh, working to precision. By the way, anyone that is a good reed maker can work to that kind of precision that you would see in a metal shop. They deal in thousands of an inch, okay, and we do too. Um, so I had a little bit of a head start. The other area that um, I've been doing a lot of work in, in particular because of the shutdown. I mean, the orchestra, the winds in the orchestra are not working right now, is racial justice. I am now a uh, certified facilitator in um, 
facilitating conversations around racial justice in uh, mixed race groups, all white groups, and so on. And uh, um, I just spent uh, two hours in a webinar today, and uh, I've got a number of groups going right now that I'm, I'm facilitating. So um, I'm branching out. So yeah, those are some things I didn't know. There's still a lot I don't know about either of those. Um, so that for me is very stimulating, re very rewarding. Do you have a favorite book recommendation? If you're interested in um, a, a description about the structures that contribute to racism worldwide, read Isabel Wilkerson's book called Caste. She went and researched um, the caste system in India, the um, structural racism in the United States historically in Nazi Germany, and found a lot of a lot of um, corollaries that 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 work. Her her uh, her her um, concept for this um, is caste. Um, caste is the bones. Racism is the skin on the bones in her in her analogy. Okay, I think it's a beautiful way of talking about it. A lot of people are put off, especially white people, are put off by talking about race. They don't want to talk about it, and they get they get very uh, upset uh, when they're called out. And so, the idea of talking about it as cast um, may bring a few more people in. She's a brilliant writer. If you read her other book, The Wealth of uh, of Others, The Warmth of Other Sons, it's about the great migration from the south of African-Americans in the mid 20th century to find the better lives in the, in the north. That's a, a, a extremely well-written book. But her, her book, Cast, is, uh, is terrific. I recommend it. What three pieces do you recommend people check out? The Mignoni waltzes are always fun. There's so many of them. You can always get something out of one of those. Those are great. Um, I'm still waiting for some great composers to write pieces for our instrument. <laughs> it's still troublesome. I'm a big fan of Miguel de la Gila's, Gila's pieces for Bassoon. He's written a couple for me and for other people. I think those are well-written pieces and very effective. So um, why don't we have people put their three favorite pieces in the chat? And I think you'll get more answers and better answers than I would give. <laughs> Yeah, Hunter has recommended, yeah, the Bach cello transcriptions. Yeah, Ian, Ian likes the Shostak inventions. Those are good pieces, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for reminding me of that, Ian. Well, oh, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Let's go ahead and end this session here.